Let me introduce you to today's presenter. Mr. Robert Warren is one of our simulation specialists out of our Cleveland office in Ohio. He's a highly experienced and competent simulation expert who's been using these tools since their early introduction into the SOLIDWORKS interface. Robert has put together a very informative presentation for us today, and Robert, I will turn it over to you. Looks like we're getting some echo. Let me double check the uh, mute status of everyone. Okay, Robert, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. I think we, I think we got that resolved. So thanks, Kurt. I appreciate it. So today's uh, webcast is Will It Mold? So we just want to talk a little bit about plastic part design, but we're going to go uh, a little bit beyond just, you know, will it mold and, and, and can we do a, a plastic uh, injection mold analysis, but we also want to look at it from a structural standpoint as well. So I just want to go through a little bit of an analysis introduction, um, and that's what we're going to cover first. We're going to look at some plastic part structural requirements. I have a specific part in mind. We're going to go ahead and load that and see that it works. And really, in the process of creating plastic parts, not only do they have to be structurally sound, but before you hand it off to a molder, and you know, uh, I've been there, I've done this, and you know, I get a I get a phone call a week later that says, you know, we we made the mold, it it didn't run, it it had a short shot, or we have issues with it. Can you change the part to X Y Z? And then we have to go back through and you know verify that it will work again structurally, as well as you know making changes so it's moldable. So what I wanted to do is kind of go through a process here and see if we can address all that up front before we hand that part off, uh, you know, to to other other individuals or a mold shop. So the first thing I want to look at is just an, an analysis introduction and just kind of what what are the products that we're going to be looking at. And the first one is. SOLIDWORKS Plastics, uh, and this is an injection mold software, so it really validates manufacturability. Can the part be molded? Are there any things that we can change with it that will give us a better part uh, due to the injection molding process? So it simulates the melted uh, flow of, of uh, resin into a mold, the cooling of that, and then it gives us feedback like warp li uh, weld lines, warp prediction, um, air trap, uh, locations, you know, in, in uh, built stress due to the molding process. So the, the plastic software gives us a, a wide range of uh, options with regards to that process. And it really comes in three flavors. So there's a plastic standard, and this is geared towards the part designer. So where I kind of fell when I was in industry was I, I did make some plastic parts. We had to have those molded. But I always had this trepidation or this kind of reservation that you know, I don't know if it will mold or not, and this is where the plastic software would have come into play and, and been a been a real uh, benefit to have because I would have had confidence passing this off to the mold shop. But this really just covers uh, flow into the cavity, and it just gives you a, a good idea of pass fail on whether or not it can be molded. Plastics Professional is kind of a midline package. It allows us to do family molds, rudder and design. Um, as well as everything that comes in plastic standard. And then plastics premium is geared more towards the mold shop or for an advanced plastics part designer. So we want to know, you know, is that part going to warp? Is it going to fit within tolerance, you know, when, when it's been injection molded and it needs to go back into the rest of the assembly? So there's a lot of good uh, feedback and, and information that Solvers Plastics simulation gives us. So that's the first uh, type of software that we're going to be looking at or analysis tool that we're going to be looking at. The second one is SOLIDWORKS Simulation, and it's our structural analysis package. And not only you know can the part be molded, but is it going to meet all of our requirements structurally for the end use? So what our simulation package does is it is finite element analysis. It takes a continuous body, divides it up, solves partial differential equations over top of that, and gives us back things like stress and strain and displacement. And as you guessed it, it comes in really three flavors. So there's static linear analysis at the SOLIDWORKS premium level. And then we have a standard uh, simulation package that can be added to any version of SOLIDWORKS. That gives us uh, really the fatigue analysis is the big one there. You know, how long is that part going to last? Professional is where most of our customers kind of stay. Um, this gives us a lot of capability in additional modes of failure like resonant frequency or drop test or thermal thermal type loading. 
And then premium, which is actually what we're going to be looking at today, mainly because of the nonlinear uh, nonlinearity of the material being a plastic a plastic material. But you can also do time dependent loading like shock analysis or or creep analysis, long duration uh, low loads. So let's go ahead and get right into it. And what we want to look at first is just the structural requirements of a plastic part that we we have created. And if we look here, uh, what we have is like a almost a shelf bracket. So there's actually going to be three of these in a row, and it's going to be have some tubing glued uh, on either end, and then a, a shelf kind of put over top of that. And with the three of those, they actually have to support 100 pounds. That's what we're rating the product at. So what we want to do is just because we're engineers, because we're conservative by nature, we're going to load one of these with 50 pounds. So we're going to take half the load and put it over top of one of these. So we're just kind of increasing the, the load there a little bit outside of the range that it normally would see. And what we want to do is we just want to keep our stress as low as possible, our displacement uh, as small as possible, and meet that minimum requirement of at least a factor of safety of two or higher. So if we jump into the software here, what you're going to see is we are right inside of SOLIDWORKS, and we're not going to leave this interface for the FEA analysis or the uh, plastics analysis. So when you turn in or you turn on uh, simulation through the add-ins, what you end up with is a tab on the super toolbar or the command manager up here at the top. And the next step is really to start a new study. Well, I have one already started. And if we look at the design, we've got pretty thin uh, top sections to this to this component. We've got a couple thin ribs. Those are probably more aesthetic than than um, structurally required. But you know we can see that through the through the analysis. Then we have the back and the front. Again, we're going to be putting 50 pounds pulling down on the end of this. We're going to assume that the back of this is fixed. It cannot move. And the reason being is it's glued or is going to be glued or adhered to uh, the rest of the structure. So when you start a new simulation, what ends up happening is it splits your command manager over here on the left. And the very first thing that we need to do is assign a material. And because this is a nonlinear material, we can assign it a true stress strain curve. And I'm using a plasticity von Mises mathematical model uh, for this guy. So that's what puts us into the nonlinear category is having that nonlinear mathematical model. And that gives us a very good understanding of what's happening with plastics, rubbers, any steels and aluminums beyond beyond yield, composites, uh, anything that's more of a more of a nonlinear material. So once we have our material assigned, because we're only analyzing just the one part, we're not going to worry about contacts and connections, but we do have a wide range of those to mimic what's happening in the real world if we were dealing with an assembly. From there, I assigned a set of fixtures. And if we look in here, uh, we have a wide range of these that we can add. In this case, I just specified that it was fixed. It cannot translate in the X, Y, and Z, but we certainly could do a fixed hinge where it, it could uh, rotate. And we do have a, a bevy of advanced fixtures. So we kind of meet all of those uh, fixture type needs with regards to simulation. And then I assigned a load to this. And again, it was that 50 pound load. And if we look, I'm specifying that the load is actually normal to, so we're going to be pushing down on this, as you can see on the screen, with 50 pounds or pulling down on it with 50 pounds. If we look at this, uh, another thing that I'm able to do is actually apply the load over time. So I, I increased the load to 100% and then I took the load off. So we can actually see if we are putting this into a plasticity range, by taking the load back off, is there going to be any residual stress or any residual strain with regards to that? So once the loads and the fixtures are applied, the next step is to mesh it. And if we take a look at the mesh, SOLIDWORKS does a good job right out of the bag uh, at refining the mesh in areas that it needs to be refined and giving us a good uh, count or, or representation of the model right, right from the, right the get-go. So from there, let's just take a look at the results that we got uh, from this. And if we take a look at the stress plot, we can see where the stress was developed on this, on this part. And we can do some things in here where we can edit what's happening. So right now I'm at that half second mark. So this was 100% of the load being applied. And what we can see here is we're right around 2,372 PSI 
our yield strength is 5,800. So we're going to be pretty close to a factor of safety of two, somewhere in there. We can look at things like our normal stresses instead of just the von Mises stress. And again, this is at 100% of the load. Or maybe we can look at our principal stresses. Or if we wanted to, we can actually take a step back, go back to the von Mises stress, and increase this to that full uh, one second when we took the load back off. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing very little stress or residual stress, a little bit on that on that component there. But overall, the structure is okay. So what we know from this is when we take and we load this with the full 50 pounds, which is at a half second here, and we take and then leave off, we don't have any residual uh, displacement or permanent plasticity in the part. So it makes us feel good about this, about this design. One of the other things that we can look at is displacement. So we're actually seeing a result in displacement about five millimeters that may or may not be within uh, the, the confines of what we want. But what we know is when we take the load off of this, we're going to see that we don't have any residual uh, stress or strain in it. And then finally, the, the important factor is, is the factor of safety, right? How does our stress compare to the yield stress of, stress of the material? We can see we're at 2.44. So we're definitely exceeding that factor of safety of two that we were concerned with uh, with regards to the design. So we feel pretty good about this. And as from a structural standpoint and from an engineering standpoint, you know, the design met all of our requirements that we had, right? Our stress was right around 2,300, factor safety at 2.44, so our boss said it had to be two or higher. We're meeting that. The next step is to actually take and pass this off or give it to the mold shop to create it. And this is where I always kind of struggled was, you know, am I creating this part to a point where it can be molded and are we going to have a long lead time because maybe I did something wrong? That was always my concern with it. And that's where plastics really kind of comes into play and just tells us, you know, will it mold? Will we have any problems with it? Are there going to be any issues? So one of the things when we get into plastics that I'm concerned with is, you know, is it going to mold? Maybe I can choose different injection locations to see if it's going to work. You know, are, do we have the correct uh, material thicknesses in, in and around the part? And for those of you who have a lot of um, injection mold design experience, you know, maybe you're already looking at this and you see where my, where my flaw is. And to be honest with you, I didn't know that the flaw was in here until I actually ran, ran this analysis. And uh, sure enough, it showed me that I had, I had some problems. So what I just did there was I turned off simulation and I turned on plastics. And in plastics, what it does is it gives you another tab here across your feature tree. And you start off by creating a mesh of the part. So very similar to simulation where you have to mesh it, you have to tell the software the geometry. Same thing here for plastics. And I'd mesh this with a solid mesh. And the reason being is anytime that you have a thin section and a thin, thick section, generally for a plastics part, you want as uniform a thickness as possible throughout the entire part. A lot of times that's not possible. In this case, you know, these are more ornamentals made to give it more of an industrial type look. They're not structure, structurally important, but they are thin. So we may have some problems, you know, molding in those areas, especially with this thicker, this thicker section. So we created the mesh, and if we look here, I can uh, take a look at the mesh of the model. And again, it's very similar to what we saw with the, with the FEA uh, software. From there, I have to specify a polymer. And if we look, I assigned a generic ABS, but we do have over 5,000 different resins in the uh, database. And you can search by family, you can search by company, you can even come in here and search by a very specific name to find that find that material. One of the nice things is even at our plastic standard level, the, the introductory level, you can add your uh, material properties as needed. So if you don't, if you do not find the material in this list of over 5,000, you have the ability to go back in and, and add your own material properties if it's something very specific to what you're doing. So we have our mesh, we have our polymer specified. From there, it's a matter of going in and talking about our flow settings. And one of the things that separates or distinguishes plastics from, from some of the other softwares is the history behind it. 
Um, so the gentleman that kind of brought plastics to SolidWorks and is, is still on the team has over 35 years of injection mold experience in industry and working uh, with, with, with the software. And one of the benefits of that are things like this. So the filling time is kind of grayed out. SolidWorks looked at the volume, it looked at the material that we assigned, and it's giving a recommended filling time for this part. You can certainly come in and you can adjust this to whatever you want. So you can turn your cycle time up or down. Uh, but it gives a good representation of, you know, a, a good best guess or first, um, you know, pass for what this might have to be. The melt temperature and the mold temperature, those come over from the material properties, but you certainly can change these within a, a, a range that you have there. And then certainly the injection pressure of the, of the uh, machine. So there is a limit. If you reach that limit of the machine, we're going to not be able to actually mold it. So the fill settings, I'm going to leave those all at default, but I want to show you that you can adjust and, and manipulate those as, as needed. And then lastly, uh, what I have here is I have an injection location that's on the back, uh, back side of the part. So it's going to fill from this side where my cursor is to the left. And we can actually get a predictive flow pattern based on where that is. So without even running the analysis, we can kind of see how the flow is going to go through. And certainly you don't have to do one injection location. You can do multiple. So you can kind of move this around and see what might work best uh, for your part. In this case, I just left it at the back, the back side of the part to see how this filled. At that point, you run the analysis, and we can take a look at the results and what plastic standard is, is really going to give us. So the first thing that we can see, and I'm going to uh, turn on my section here, is we can see how the part fills through uh, the geometry or how this resin kind of moves through this cavity. And we can see that it really kind of travels through these top two sections rather quickly. I mean, our flow front is all, almost all the way to the end of the part. And if we look here, we haven't quite filled out these really thin areas. So just from the fill settings, I understand that, you know, maybe this is problematic. And not even knowing injection molding uh, probably as well as I should or, or I should have at the time when I was designing plastic parts, you know, this would have been a good glaring indicator. Hey, we've got some we've got some issues here. So let me uh, actually slow this down and we can animate this again. And really kind of just take a look at what's happening here. So it's filling this this uh, back boss and it's starting into kind of that center piece uh, and then the two upper flanges. And we can see that those are really kind of what they call in the industry race tracking ahead of the rest of this geometry. And we're really not even at a point where this part's filled. Generally, when you have a flow front moving across a part, you want everything to the back of that flow front to be filled before it moves forward. So I have an inherent design flaw in this part. And had I, you know, given this to the mold shop and they may not have caught that, they could have cut the prototype mold, came back and said, hey, we've got some major problems. We need to make some changes. And then that's just time and money for you to get that part, that get that part back out. So one of the things that we can look at is fill time. Another great part of plastics, and again, this comes with that experience of the, of the head of the uh, development team, is this results advisor up here in the right-hand uh, corner. And it really gives you a red light, green light, uh, yellow light scenario. If it was green, everything's good. And it even would give you some suggestions on what you could change to maybe make the injection a little bit more efficient. In this case, we have a red light, and it tells us a short shot has been detected. Uh, meaning the part mold has failed to fill 100% of the mold. Uh, we've reached that maximum injection pressure, and it gives us some feedback on what you could try to do uh, to eliminate short shots. One of them would be to increase your maximum injection pressure. The default injection pressure that the machine has that is we're virtually using is pretty standard. Uh, to go to a higher injection pressure, you're going to be paying a lot more money to run that on a bigger machine. Um, you know, another thing would be to increase the uh, injection time, possibly in increasing the uh, temperature of the mold and the temperature of the melt as it comes in, and then certainly, you know, where that gate might be. And then another suggestion that it has in here is to adjust the thicknesses of the parts so that they're, they're more even. So the advisor gives us a really good feel for, you know, kind of where we need to go. 
And if we look through here, we can see things like shear stress at the end of fill. We can see that there's a lot of shear on these ribs, and that's because we're just not at a point where we can push that forward uh, and, and push that part through. So if the flow front comes through with a low shear, like we see at this top flange and the bottom flange, it means it flowed through there pretty easily. Here we see a high, high shear stress. It's indicating that we had a problem filling that. One of the other things that we can see is this gate filling contribution. You can see these little red areas. Those did not fill. We had a short shot in the part. You can also see ease of fill, and this really indicates those areas that we had problems with, you know, fully, fully filling uh, the mold. And then another is the frozen area at end of fill. So what parts are frozen or essentially solidified, what parts are not, and we can see that we have some, some issues in there. So a lot of good feedback with regards to what's happening in the part, and really the big one there is that red light, yellow light, yellow light and green light indicating, hey, we have a short shot. We've got, we have some design problems, uh, you know, with, with this part. So what did we see with the initial, you know, flow into the cavity? Well, we saw we had a short shot, right? We were over the injection pressure limit, and we gained some feedback on, you know, some things that we could try. And one of those things that we're going to try is we're going to make a change to the SOLIDWORKS model. And I did this by using a configuration. You can actually copy your studies from one uh, part to another. And what I did was I reduced the thickness of the upper and lower flange. So it's just a model change in the configuration. Everything else stayed the same. We just want to know, you know, by making this uh, part have a little bit more uniform uh, thickness, so I'm going to go ahead and switch to that configuration of the part, and what you're going to see is the, the wall thickness is going to go down. You know, will this mold at this point? Well, what I did was I used the duplicate study, and I was able to bring over everything that I had already filled out. So we have the solid uh, specified the mesh uh, carried over it did have to remesh because the geometry did change. My polymer carried over. My injection location is still on the back of the part. So everything else stayed the same. And when I ran the flow analysis for this, what we can see is that the part actually does fill because we, we uh, changed that thickness. And the reason that that worked is that it's more uniform. So we're having to, or we're trying to push the same amount of t material through these areas, and what you're going to see here is it doesn't really racetrack ahead of itself. It has a nice uniform movement as it kind of fills through there. So we're getting a lot better feel for this kind of filling and, and moving through that. So it didn't change the injection location. It didn't change anything but the fact that I, I, I adjusted that geometry. So we feel pretty good about the fill aspect of this. The other thing that we can look at uh, with this is weld lines. So weld lines are where two flow fronts come together, and a lot of times they could be a cosmetic issue or they could even be a structural issue. So, you know, if we knew that this part was seeing a lot of load or had a lot of stress in this area, and we see that there's a weld line in that, in that analysis where those two flow fronts came together, that's an inherent weak spot in the part. So this is something that we can take back to our structural analysis and see if we have any high stress in this area. If we do, we know that we may need to move the injection location or maybe adjust how the flow goes through the part to, uh, you know, eliminate where these weld lines are. So the two kind of work hand in hand as you're designing the part. Another thing that you could pass on to the molder is you know, just where the air traps are. These would be areas that the uh, mold would need to be vented to see what was going on. And in professional and premium, we can actually do a vent analysis where you can put vents on the part and watch these air traps kind of move around and, and be eliminated, which is actually pretty pretty cool. And if we look at that uh, solution advisor here, what we're seeing is we, got, we have the green light. So this is actually good. The part can be successfully filled with an injection pressure of 38 MPA. 100 MPA was our, our max. So we're within 66%. So as far as I'm concerned with designing this part, I know that this, this can mold. So I feel pretty confident handing this off to, to the mold shop. The only problem with that is we changed our design. We changed the structure of the, of the geometry. And what we need to do is really go back and just verify, you know, is this the best, the best design? 
So it passed moldability, and we were able to see, you know, where those weld lines were. We can take that back and kind of see from the next structural verification if we have high stress in that area. So if we look, we have the exact same uh, goals or the exact same uh, specifications for the new design, the, the thinner uh, flanges on this. Factor safety of two or higher and just as low a stress and as low displacement uh, as possible. So if we look, I turn plastics back off and what I'm going to do is get back into the simulation. And what we see here now is I can take a look at the structural aspect and just like in plastics, I was able to take this original study and I was able to copy it. And I was able to copy it to this thinner configuration so the material carried over, my fixture in the back carried over, and my load up here in the front carried over. I did have to remesh it, but if we take a look at the results, I think we're going to be pretty happy with what we see. So we're right around 2,799 PSI, so our stress did go up. And it did go up because of the fact that, you know, it's a thinner part. It's able to move a little bit more which equates to, uh, you know, a higher, a higher stress value. I do not see high stress in this area where my cursor is. And that's a good thing, right? If we saw high stress here, then we would need to look at what's going on with those knit lines. At this point, we feel okay. That knit line is not in the high stress area, so we should be, we should be all right structurally from that standpoint. We can look at the displacement. The displacement stood, did go up, but, you know, maybe, eight millimeters is our cutoff, so we're still, you know, well within that. And then the more important one is the factor of safety, just where are we at? And what we can see is with these changes to make the part moldable, we were able to still stay above a factor of safety of two, but we are pretty close. We're at 2.073. So that may be, uh, you know, a point of concern until we go back and realize that we're actually loading this more than it's actually going to see. Remember, there were going to be three of these brackets uh, you know, across this shelf that we're going to hold a maximum of 100 pounds. We're putting half of that load on just one. So we still feel pretty good that our factor safety is right at, uh, right at two. So we were able to verify, hey, you know, in those areas of the, of the knit lines or the weld lines, we don't have a high stress. So we feel pretty good there. Our stress was right around, you know, 2,799 and the factor safety was 2.07. So we're, we are meeting and exceeding those those kind of design requirements. So the two softwares right inside of SOLIDWORKS really work hand in hand to make sure that everything is okay with our design. So, you know, I've had just the structural aspect before and I've sent it out to a mold shop and seen, hey, we need to make these changes, then I have to rerun the analysis. With plastics, we're actually able to go in, verify that it'll mold before we even pass this off hopefully eliminating, you know, those long lead times, eliminating the rework cost of redoing those molds. And, you know, overall, it really gives you a lot of good confidence in the design uh, to move forward. And then with plastics, you know, if you wanted to get into it, we can do more advanced analysis. So family molds, just to make sure that, hey, all four of these are going to fill the same. We can do runner design and pack analysis. And what I want to show you here is let me turn uh, simulation off. I'll go back into plastics. And what I want to show you with this is that we can actually look at the warp of the parts. So, you know, everything's well and good with the fill stage. So we, we feel okay with that. We feel good with our structural design. But, you know, maybe there is a tolerance requirement that we have with this part that, you know, it cannot shrink or it cannot move, you know, more than, uh, you know, 25 thousandths, let's say. With regards to that, we can run not only a flow analysis, which is the fill into the cavity, we can run a pack analysis, which is holding the, um, the pressure on the part as it cools, but then we can also run a warp analysis to understand the overall displacement of, of the part. And if we look here, what we can see is the overall displacement that we would be receiving with this. So after this has been ejected and it continues to cool a little bit outside of the mold, due to the immolded stresses, due to the quenching thermal stress, and the inherent sink marks, we can see that this is actually displacing and it's, and it's moving in a little bit on us. And if this is an acceptable warp, um, you know, as far as the shrinking from one end to the other, 
we now know that you know when we when we mold this, maybe we need to make the shelf just a little bit shorter so that it fits within within this uh, shrink that we would get out of it. If not, what you can do is you can actually export out a counter deformed um, shrink value or deformed shape so that when this does warp, it warps back to the nominal the nominal size. So that's always a, a possibility there as well. And just so you know, this is an exaggerated uh, uh, scale on this on how much that is actually going to, going to shrink uh, on that part. So the warp analysis is also uh, very, very um, important. And just to show you the capability, uh, what I did was I set this up as a family mold. And to do a family mold, you have multiple cavities, uh, as you see here. And then you can do either a um, solid runner system, or in this case, I did a virtual runner system. So all that I did was I drew in a sketch that had this kind of branched um, setting and then I virtually put in my runner system. So I designed that uh, here using the runner elements. And one of the things that we can look at this is we can actually look at the flow through these four these four cavities. Let's say instead of creating the exact same part we had an upper and lower portion of the same of the same component. So an upper and, and lower half maybe of your mouse or a smoke alarm or, you know, your phone, anything that would have a top, upper and, and lower shell. The importance of that is you want to mold those using the exact same resin because of the percentage of regrind, things like that that may occur. One of the nice things with this is we can actually set up a runner optimization that adjusts the runner size so that each cavity, whether they're all the same or they are different, will fill at the exact same time and then you can pass that on to the mold shop or if you are the mold shop you have a head uh, head start on kind of optimizing those runners uh, through the design. So I wanted to show you the warp the warp capability and then also the uh, fill analysis on a on a family mold uh, here as well. So plastics and SolidWorks uh, simulation give us the tools to really compare both kind of sections of the part design. Not only is it structurally um, sound for how we want it, but it is also um, able to be molded and we have that confidence in the design to kind of pass that, pass that along. So that is what I have uh, prepared for you. Uh, any questions that have, have come in? Thank you, Robert. Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, the chat window here. We do have one question that that uh, came in. It's related to um, the gate location prediction mm -hmm. uh, capabilities related to that. I know we have the uh, automatic uh, gate location within the injection location. Um, you want to try to address that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Not a problem. So that's actually a great uh, a great question. So with regards to the regards to the geometry, and again, this is this is one of those where you have the benefit of being inside of SolidWorks, and in in that um, you know um, background, you know of, of the developers with injection molding, when you do an injection location, we have the ability. So I'm going to go ahead and undo the one that I have here. I'm going to remove that. And what we can do is we can actually say automatically add locations and we can tell the software how many we may want. Maybe I just want one or I want uh, multiple. And what it does is it tries to understand a relative volume. So in this case, the part not only shrinks from, in this case, left to right, but also from the back to the front uh, sideways. So the, the front boss is a little bit thinner and then it does have draft on it as well. So it looks at the volume amount and, and puts a gate uh, so that similar volumes, uh, you know, fill. So in this case, I had it automatically at one, and then we can look at the predicted flow pattern with this as well. But we can do multiple gates, have it automatically add multiple gates. And, you know, if you don't like where that is, but, you know, maybe you wanted it to be an edge gate, that gives you an approximate location, maybe where my cursor is, to put that gate location and it's still uh, relatively the same amount of volume that that one gate would be filling from side to side. So ultimately, you know, one end 
both ends fill at the, the, the same appropriate time. So yeah, we the predicted flow pattern and the automatically adding locations is definitely a, a benefit to having the plastics the plastic program. Great. Thank you, Robert. I'll, we'll uh, keep an eye on the chat there if anybody has any more questions. And I uh, wanted to show you the upcoming webinars that we have in store for you. Uh, so you'll see we have one on uh, DriveWorks Design Automation on the 18th coming up um, next week. And our next Catapult session uh, related to Turn Your SolidWorks into a Kinematic Whiteboard on the 20th. We've got the uh, Roland CNC. Uh, webcast on the 25th, and then we're really excited about our Design Innovation Month webcasts in which the month of October you're going to see two webcasts every day for the full month. So we'll have a, a very busy month in October with the rollouts of the What's New information and, and some of the uh, presentations that are going to be given live at some of our locations. And then, like you see here, our first uh, webcast related to Design Innovation Month will be on October 1st, one at 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Central. Um, you should have gotten some uh, some emails related to those to that Design Innovation Month. Some invitations for that. If not, please feel to go out to our website, as you see there on the screen, and uh, check out the events that we have scheduled for you. So thank you very much for attending today, and we hope you have a great week. And thanks, Robert, for a great webcast. Yep, thank you.